Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the field of psychology and mental health, with host Gabe Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Psych Central Show podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and with me, as always, is Vincent M. Wales. And next week is our 100th episode. In order to make it very special for our listeners, Michelle Hammer from the podcast, A Bipolar, A Schizophrenic, and a Podcast, also here on the Psych Central Network. You can find it at psychcentral.com slash BSP. We'll be hosting and asking Vince and I very cool questions about how this podcast came to be. So this week, listen to this show, and then check out Michelle Hammer and Gabe Howard over on A Bipolar, A Schizophrenic, and a Podcast. And then next week, listen to the 100th episode and learn all about the Psych Central Show podcast. Vince, how you doing? Doing okay. How are you? Excellent. So I understand that today we are talking about mental health in the workplace, and you have brought an expert with you whose name is Gabe, right? Yes, I have, because I am the expert. A lot of people don't realize that in addition to being the co-host of a very popular podcast about mental illness, mental health, and psychology... I also do workplace mental health trainings to try to make employers understand how this benefits them and try to help employees understand how this benefits them. It really is a a partnership between employer and employee. And I think a lot of people don't realize this. I mean, not surprising. A lot of people just really don't understand how important mental health education is to our society in general. Well, welcome to the show. Yeah, well, thanks. Well, thanks. I, I hear that the one host is very, very good, and the other host is you. Is really funny. <laughs> it's always a pleasure, Vince. Yeah. So, um, first off, why exactly is mental health in the workplace such an important topic for you? It does go along with my overall goal of educating society about the importance of mental health and how we sort of ignore this at our own peril. But for me personally, when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I I worked for a very large company and I made very good money and I had excellent performance reviews and it was in a field and I just, I excelled in this position. And within a year of being diagnosed, I was ultimately terminated from that position and their reason was because I was faking bipolar disorder. Now, we don't, we don't need to fall down the rabbit hole on all of this. The, the bottom line is, is I had a job that I excelled at, a job that I earned my living with, and a job that carried my health insurance. And when I got sick, because of all the misinformation about mental illness and because of the stigma of mental illness, it made it very easy for them to turn their back on me, which left me in harm's way. It left me without resources. It left me without health insurance. Mm-hmm. But more than all of that... It was devastating. My job was my identity. It's not just what I use to pay my bills. It was, it's one of the top three questions we ask strangers. Right, right. So now, yours was a situation of mental illness in the workplace, but we're really going to talk about mental health. And there's a difference between the two. Yes, you are absolutely correct. There is a, there is a difference between mental illness and mental health, sort of. Mental illness is mental health. It's just being very sick. It's mental bad health. Yeah, mental bad health. But mental health works identically, identically to physical health. Imagine if instead of saying I have the flu or I have cancer or I have diabetes or I broke my leg, we just called everything physical health. No matter what happened to you, we said that you were physically unhealthy. Actually, we didn't even say physically unhealthy because that would make a little more sense. We said that you were physical health. Hey, is Vin coming to work today? No, he's physical health. So we don't know if you're an end stage illness getting ready to die in hospice or if you have food poisoning. And this is really how we sort of discuss mental health and mental illness in our society. We just lump it all together. Mm -hmm. There is a big difference between having a bad mental health day between suffering from bad mental health symptoms and having severe and persistent mental illness. And the example that I always like to use is the difference between grief and uh, schizophrenia. Most people understand that schizophrenia is a long-term illness. It's something they have for the for the for your entire life. It's a mental illness, it's severe and persistent, it's something that involves everyday management. 
Grief is something that is onset by something. Somebody dies. You, you lose your spouse. You lose a child. You lose a parent. Nobody is going to be at their best the day after a loved one dies. So we would not say that that person has good mental health. But we also wouldn't say that that person was mentally ill. And this is what we need people to understand because so many people are afraid to admit that they're having a mental health crisis or a mental health problem because they're afraid that they will be labeled mentally ill or in the parlance of our times, crazy, nuts, wacko, less than. And this is true, not even for those who have severe mental illness, but for those who just need what I like to refer to as a mental health day. Absolutely. Stress. Yeah. And we lie. We call and say, yeah, I'm feeling under the weather. You know, I think I maybe ate something bad or whatever. When the truth is, is you just need to chill out. As I've said a million times, it's fascinating to me that people would rather their coworkers think that they're at home with diarrhea than they're at home recuperating from, you know, lack of sleep or stress or grief or any of these things that do contribute to our overall mental health. I, I cannot state this unequivocally enough. Everybody, everybody who is alive has mental health. You may not be having a mental health problem. In fact, most people have good mental health. Most people have mostly good mental health with occasionally bad mental health. Just like their physical health. Yes, just like their physical health. Most of us are healthy most of the time. But also, most of us will get the flu, we'll get a runny nose, we'll get a cold, and yes... We will get diarrhea. And this is how we need to understand it because so many people don't want to discuss anything to do with mental health because, Vin, they're emotions. And we mm-hmm. don't want to handle our emotional health, which, of course, is our mental health. And you can see where this is a problem for both employers and employees because both of those people are people. Mm-hmm. And whether you like it or not, people have mental health which means they could have bad mental health and they're going to have it in the workplace. That's right. One of the differences too is that, you know, like if you have a coworker who obviously is sick, they they have a cold, they're sneezing, they've got a runny nose and stuff. You can go up and say, dude, are you okay? You, You don't sound real good. But what do you do when you think they might be having an episode of depression, for example? This is where it gets really, really tricky. The first thing is, is I'd love to tell you that you do the exact same thing. Because in reality, that is the best answer. If you suspect that somebody has the flu, has a cold, is going to faint or pass out, you should interject immediately on their behalf for their physical safety. So obviously, if you think that somebody is having a mental health crisis, you should interject yourself for their safety, for both their their mental health safety and ultimately for their physical safety. But people have a real problem with that. People have a real problem with that because they think they're going to offend the person that they're asking. And they have a real problem with it because they're not sure what to say. So understanding all of that, the reality is, is you really should still do the same thing. However, in order to protect yourself, you should do it privately. Give Mm -hmm. them the privacy that they need. Pull them aside. Keep them away from everybody else and stick to the facts. Don't draw conclusions. Don't say, you're depressed. Say, I'm worried about you. Is everything okay? Is something going on? How can I be of assistance? And my favorite one to use is that you have been acting differently than usual. Is everything okay? Because now you're tying in that you've noticed something. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this will create the safe space for them to come to you. I cannot state this plainly enough. Do not assume that you know. Even if you think you do, don't walk up and say, you're suffering from depression. Because that, that's, that's not helpful. And in our culture right now, everybody, myself included, will dig their heels in. I am not, I'm fine. What are you accusing me of? People see it as an insult. And mm-hmm. until that changes, you're, you're better off taking a more subtle approach. And a private one. Okay. Now... What about in cases where the individual does have a mental illness that they have disclosed? It's it's public knowledge. How do you behave around them? What, What things should you or should you not say to them? That sort of thing. 
the first thing is, is there's there's always the point in these conversations where I say, look, you realize that you're talking about a person that's now disclosed. So ask them. That really is the best answer. You should ask them how they want you to behave. What do they want you to do? We are afraid to have these conversations, but if somebody comes up and says, look, I'm disclosing to my team, to my supervisor, to HR, I live with bipolar disorder, that is the best opportunity to say, excellent, if I notice that you are symptomatic, what should I do? What do you want? And finally, just like in the case of physical health, everybody who has ever taken a first aid course hears the same thing. If something is wrong, step one, call 911. Step two, assess the situation. And for some reason in mental health, we feel that all of the sudden, if we notice that somebody is having the symptoms of mental illness, a mental health crisis, we decide to deputize ourselves as a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a therapist, a case manager. All you need to do is hold down the fort until help arrives. If somebody is having a mental health crisis or a mental illness crisis, call their emergency contact or call 911 and keep them safe until help arrives. Mental health is no different than physical health in this regard, but for some reason we think it is. This is not adopt a mentally ill person day. This is just keep somebody safe until help arrives. All excellent points, thank you. And we're gonna step away for just a minute to hear from our sponsor and we'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. And now we're back. All right, so you mentioned before talking about disclosure, talking to human resources and, and whomever else. When it comes to human resources, that's where they deal with you know the legal rights and responsibilities of employers. Why don't you give us a little breakdown of, of what the common ones are? It's very important to say at this point that it varies state by state. And obviously I know we're an international show, so if you live in another country other than America, I got very little for you because the, the laws are, are very different country to country. But there are certain rights that everybody with a disability has. For example, you can't be fired for disclosing that you have a mental illness. Human resources is your ally on making sure that you get reasonable accommodations. And I want people to really understand reasonable at this point. Because in my case, if I had been given reasonable accommodations, I could have stayed at my job. I, I asked to have my cubicle moved. I asked to have a couple extra breaks. I needed a little bit more time off. But ultimately, all of those things were well within the amount of time off that I had and well within what my employer could do. And they were reasonable accommodations. Let's, let's interrupt here for a second. What's, what would be reasonable and what would be unreasonable? Reasonable are small things that the employer can do that doesn't impact their business by a lot. And I know that's kind of a vague standard, but what is reasonable are a couple of extra breaks a day. Unless, and this is where it gets really, really tricky, unless you have a job where breaks are unreasonable. Like for example, if you're a pilot. You know, a, a, mm. a pilot can't step outside every hour. That's that's not reasonable. They they Nor safe. Right. So that is how come there's there's not hard and fast rules on these things, except that there are hard and fast rules. And your human resources department will know those for your business. Listen, I have bipolar disorder. And when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, there were certain jobs that were immediately taken off the table for me, like nuclear arms specialist. I could see why somebody with severe and persistent mental illness should probably not be inspecting nuclear warheads. So there probably aren't any reasonable accommodations that could be given to a guy like me to do that. Now, now please don't email me and say, well, I have bipolar and I inspect nuclear warheads. I, that, that's, that's good for you. Um, and, and I'm glad that, that you can do that job. But I had to find a job that I fit in and that involved working with my employer. You need to work with your employer to find a job that you can excel at and that reasonable accommodations can be made. Things like moving your desk. Moving your desk is reasonable, but again, here's the caveat. What if you're a receptionist? 
Right. Yeah, reception can't have their desk move to a quiet place. Their desk needs to be in a busy place, you know, like in the reception area. This is why these things are very, very complicated. But I want to say that Human Resources knows what rights they owe you. And you need to read up on your job on what reasonable accommodations are. And reasonable accommodations are largely things that won't have a giant impact on the business. That's why I use my example. Moving my desk to the end of the row, I worked off the phones. It didn't matter where I answered that phone. That would not have caused anybody any problems. Giving me a couple of extra breaks. In the in the course of the eight hours, my statistics were, were light years above most of my employees. So I was still more productive with the breaks than without. The problem that I caused, Gabe Howard caused for my employer, is that the other employees complained. And they said, well, it's not fair that Gabe got to choose his desk. It's not fair that Gabe gets a couple of extra breaks. And the employer decided to handle that by, well, ultimately terminating my employment. This was a bad idea for them. It was a bad idea for them from a legal standpoint. It was a bad idea for them for the damage that they caused a good employee. And it was a bad idea for them from a business perspective because they lost me. And I was a really good employee. And it also sent a message, this is very important for employers to hear, whenever you don't back an employee with a, with a condition, with any condition, you send a message to all of your other employees that if they get sick, you won't back them either. So now they have a reason to hide their medical conditions from you. Nobody is at their best when they are not at their best physical or mental health. Do you really want your business represented by people who are sick and unwilling to get the help they need to be well? Because remember, they're out there representing your business. And they have already accepted that they're not at 100%, but they don't want to tell you for fear of repercussions. It's also illegal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to mental health, I mean, it's... This is all self-reported stuff. It's not like your doctor is going to call up your workplace and say, hey, by the way, Gabe has bipolar disorder. Well, in fact, the doctor can't call your workplace and right. say that. Right. But we talk about bad outcomes. You know, while this is incredibly rare, while it is incredibly, incredibly rare for somebody to, quote, snap at work and be violent or harm somebody, it's not unheard of. And in all of those cases... For the most part, I, I haven't studied every single one, but certainly the ones that are largely in the news, everybody says, well, you know, they were acting weird for a while. Mm -hmm. There was issue. We always thought he was odd, but nobody did anything about it. And that person did not feel comfortable disclosing. That person didn't feel comfortable seeking help. So when you talk about why you want to have a mental health receptive workplace, there are some very powerful motivators, whether it be to not risk legal action, whether it be to have a productive and engaged workforce, or whether it be to not have an issue so that your workplace ends up in the news. And finally, just be decent. Most companies excel because of their people. There are very few companies that are excelling for things that don't have to do with their employees. In fact, I can't really think of any, but I, I in general don't like to speak in absolutes. So if your workforce is terrified of getting the help they need for fear of losing their job, you're gonna have a bunch of untreated mentally ill people running your business. That alone, should be enough of a reason to have a mental health receptive workplace. I agree. Let's take a look at something else. Mental health is, like all health, there's a spectrum, mild and severe. Yes. What effect does age have on things? And we know that as we get older, our bodies tend to, well, you know, break down. And our minds, well, some people suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's, but you know, what about aside from that? Is, is age a factor in, in this situation? I would love to tell people that as we get older, our, our brains work exactly the same. The research does not hold this up. The fact of the matter is, is when I was 20 years old, 
I could stay up all night and work all day, no problem. I could physically handle that and I could mentally handle that. I'm now 40 and I go to bed at 9.30. 20 year old Gabe would be disgusted, just absolutely <laughs> disgusted with 40 year old Gabe. And if we're all honest with ourselves, if all the 40 year olds are honest with themselves, they know that they need more rest, more recuperation, more sleep and more time in between big events than they used to. They need more recuperation time, both physically and again, if we're being honest, mentally. Mm -hmm. So as we get an aging workforce going, if we're expecting the same thing out of our 60 year old employees physically as we are out of our 20 year old employees, everybody would roll their eyes and say, well, that's incredibly stupid. Well, who on earth would think that that was a good idea? Right. Yet for reasons unknown, in some industries, we expect the same mentally out of our 60-year-old employees as we do out of our 20-year-old employees. Now, all is not lost. This isn't a call to get rid of 60-year-old employees, not even close. Just because a 60-year-old thinks differently from a 20-year-old doesn't mean that they don't have their quote-unquote superpowers. They do. Their experience alone means they don't have to think as much. My grandfather can look at something and solve the problem in two seconds flat because he's seen it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Whereas a 20 year old's never seen this before, so they don't immediately know the answer. It's why certain riddles are really easy for 60 year olds. It's because they've heard them a thousand times. They all know that the guy was standing on an ice cube and that's how he hung himself in the empty room. It, it's, it's much like this. Just because a 60 year old thinks differently doesn't mean that they think incorrectly, but if you're not acknowledging that difference, you're not understanding how mental health applies to different age groups. And again, this idea that we have in our head that all people are always the same, always, is absolute nonsense. There is a reason my grandmother no longer drives on the freeway. It's because we don't love her. I'm not going to lie. That's why. <laughs> no, sincerely, we, we accept that. My grandmother still has a license. She still drives a car. She just accepts that at 83 years old, she should not be driving 80 miles an hour down, down the freeway. She's accepted this. She's a smart woman. Good for her. We are very close to the end of the show. What final words have you got? If you want to have a mental health receptive workplace, you need to understand some basic things. If somebody discloses that they have mental illness and you treat them differently from somebody who discloses that they have physical illness, you are creating a hostile work environment. It's frankly that simple. If somebody tells you that they have severe and persistent diabetes and you all send them a get well card and somebody tells you that they have severe and persistent mental illness and you all ignore it, you are creating an unsafe workspace. You are saying that one illness is worthy of condolences or acceptance or acknowledgement and the other illness isn't. It's also a very dangerous proposition to do because when nothing is said, it allows people to assume what is being said. And in general, when they see other people get support for their illness and the person who has severe and persistent mental illness or a mental health crisis gets no support, it is easy for them to assume that you don't care. And what's even worse is maybe you just don't care, but what they're going to perceive is that you care in a negative way. You are actively right. angry at them. You are bothered by them. And that is going to cause them even more problems because now in addition to being sick, in addition to having a mental health concern, they now have a workplace problem that they need to manage on top of their issue. So it is very important that you remember consistency is key. This is a, this is just a human resources buzz phrase these days. Consistency is key. Treat all men the same, treat all women the same, treat all races the same, treat all people the same, and you will stay out of legal problems. But for some reason, if you treat the mentally ill guy different, or if you treat the guy in a mental health crisis different, well, that's okay, because after all, they're mentally ill. I'm telling you, that is not the case. It is not the case. You are creating a hostile work environment, and again, you are sending a message to everybody that you are going to treat people differently based on the illness that they have. And that is not okay. And from a human perspective, you're not doing your employee any favors. You, you are hurting them on a human level. And I do believe that most supervisors care about most of their employees and most bosses care about their, their employees and coworkers care about other coworkers. 
So it is important to acknowledge these in all the same way. If you want a mental health receptive workplace, treat all illnesses identical. Again, excellent advice. Thank you. It's almost like I do this professionally. I know, right? <laughs> All right, so obviously, listeners, we, we cannot give you legal advice. Neither of us are attorneys. Um, if you have a concern that your workplace has wronged you in some way, then talk with human resources. Talk to, your, to an attorney, a real one, not us. Um, we hope that you will learn from listening to this show that you know some of what your rights are, that you can advocate for yourself which is the most important thing, I think. Gabe, thanks again. This has been real. You want to take us out of here? Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And remember, you can get one week of free, convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere by visiting betterhelp.com slash psychcentral. Vince, I will see you next week. Awesome. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you for listening to The Psych Central Show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. We encourage you to share our show on social media and with friends and family. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show. Psychcentral.com is the Internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is an award-winning writer and speaker who travels nationally. You can find more information on Gabe at GabeHoward.com. Our co-host, Vincent M. Wales, is a trained suicide prevention crisis counselor and author of several award-winning speculative fiction novels. You can learn more about Vincent at VincentMWales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email TalkBack at PsychCentral.com. 